Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on optimization with Bayesia Labs target dynamic profile function. My name is Stefan Konradi and I'm the managing partner of Bayesia USA. Okay, now I get the slides to, to move. In a way, um, this webinar today is a sequel on the webinar on importance, which we hosted back in August. For those of you who missed it, we have a recording available at this URL. Uh, there we in introduce quite a number of concepts related to importance, everything from arc force, node force, mutual information, etc. So what we will do now is we will quickly provide a recap of that webinar on, well, what is importance and how can we quantify it? And then move on to our new objectives. How can we operationalize these measures of importance? More specifically, what can we decide in terms of what is the best course of action? And the context here is we're going to use a key driver's analysis of auto buyer satisfaction, uh, where we try to use the insights from the survey plus the model uh, to really prioritize what, products improve, what product improvements we should pursue. So a very tr traditional prototypical example of using Bayesian networks. As always, the slides, the network, and the recording will be available. The underlying data, however, will not. That's proprietary data, and so we can share that. But the network itself, without the data, we can share. So, and for those of you who haven't been to our Bayesia Lab conference, this will also be the first time you get to see Bayesia Lab 9 in action. That's the software we'll be using in today's webinar. Now let's get to our topic. Um, it is the, the vehicle segment that we study is that of 2009 midsize sedans. Uh, it's perhaps not the most exciting vehicle segment, but it's hugely important for the auto industry. These are really the big volume sellers and most often the uh, best selling car in the country is out of that segment. So we'll more specifically look at one particular vehicle in that segment. I won't tell you, however, which one it is because I really don't want to get sidetracked by, you know, discussing the subject matter. I really want to focus on methodology. Now, the, all the data that I'm referencing here comes from the new vehicle experience survey. Hold on. Why does my slide not move? Here we go. Um, that is regularly conducted by Strategic Vision. And if you've ever purchased a new vehicle, you probably have received one of those surveys. They're very, very comprehensive. They have, uh, first of all, lots and lots of respondents, which is great. And then they also have lots of variables or lots of questions, a total of a thousand variables, some of which are derived from the VIN number of your vehicle. Others are about your lifestyle, demographic, psychographics. What we're interested in today are the questions about vehicle attributes and how satisfied you are with your particular vehicle. Now, one of the challenges in this context is that most people are really quite happy with their cars. And, and that shouldn't surprise us. Most cars are really good these days, uh, highly reliable, fuel efficient and safe. So in that sense, it's quite challenging to figure out, well, what should be improved? What should an automaker do to improve the satisfaction with a particular product? So what we want to do really is now relate all these variables that we have all these responses about individual product attributes to the overall new vehicle experience. That's the kind of the, the main question. How do you overall like your vehicle? That's the overall satisfaction score. Now, um, with so many individual questions, 
and attributes, it's really quite challenging to see the forest for all the trees. I mean, just, just look at what we have here. We have questions about, you know, how much you like your radio controls, how much you like your taillight design, how much you like your spare tire. You know, there are probably things that don't, you don't regularly think about. But all those things are being asked in the survey. So very, very rich, really a font of knowledge for, for anyone who works in product planning or product management. So these are the variables that were asked, that were collected from the respondents. And what we've done to make it more manageable, we've performed a factor analysis. We've used Bayesian Lab to induce 16 latent factors or clusters uh, to boil the 98 manifest variables down into yeah, a more limited number of more or less self-explanatory concept, hidden concepts that we can in interpret or more easily work with. Now, today we don't have time to really go into the entire process of um, yeah, inducing those factors. However, we have a separate seminar on that. It's, it's like a three or four hour seminar that deals exclusively with how we can derive factors from these manifest variables. I just want to give you a quick visual to, to show you what that looks like or um, what this hierarchical model from manifest to factors to the target variable looks like. So here in the outer ring in with the orange background, we have the manifest variables, which are connected to the 16 latent factors with the ring shaded in blue. And then at the very center, we have the target node. So, so that's what we have. But we will now discard all the manifest variables and rather focus just on the 16 factors. Those are the ones we use to, to understand what drives overall customer satisfaction. But one very important thing to bear in mind here is that with this model, with this machine learned model, um, we can only perform observational inference. So you may, um, and, and I'll elaborate on this uh, a little bit further. I mean, you can immediately see from by looking at this network, all the arcs are outbound from the node, kind of suggesting that overall new vehicle experience perhaps causes these uh, perception on visibility, design and proportions, price and value, and so on. But that's counter our intuition here because we're thinking or we're looking at this domain well how could we perhaps improve any of these any of these themes any of these factors in order to increase overall new vehicle satisfaction well let me let me illustrate this a little bit further so we can only perform observational inference with this machine learned model and of course you may think well perhaps that's a problem because we're trying to use this as a decision aid to figure out what actions we should perform to improve customer um, satisfaction. Well, it's not necessarily a problem because as it turns out, we can directly manipulate consumer, consumer opinion in a causal sense anyway, because really, this is not like a machine or you know a budget where I can manipulate and set the values to my to my the values of my choice. Rather, we're trying to influence a consumer to believe certain things or to see certain things that are in sync with our objectives. So we can just dial in our consumer to the values we want. Rather what we can think about is, well, what if somebody were, or if a consumer or a car buyer were more satisfied with performance, well, what would be their overall satisfaction? So we can hypothesize, that's what we will do here. And for that, observational inference is, um, um, for, for that, for, for that purpose, observational inference is, um, is, is perfect, it's 
perfectly appropriate. So let's now do this. Um, I will, uh, we will now switch to Bayesia Lab or rather to screenshots of Bayesia Lab. Um, and for those of you who are not so familiar with Bayesia Lab, uh, let me just explain the, the, the structure of the, or the, the screen layout. On the left, we have a graph panel or the graph panel rather that shows us the structure of the network. On the right hand side, we have what is called the monitor panel because inside the monitor panel, we have the so-called monitors. And I'll just zoom in on two of them right now. And um, I have one, I'm highlighting one for overall new vehicle experience, which is at the center of the graph. You can see the distribution here of the values of that node, of that target node. And then another one I'm, I have highlighted is the, the monitor that represents the node for interior roominess. Now what you will notice here is that overall new vehicle experience is recorded or shown or the distribution is shown relative to its original scale. So the rating scale was 1.5 to 9.5. I don't honestly know why the, the, the numerical values are that way. I think it has historical reasons for that particular survey. But that's, that's the rating scale, the original rating scale. For interior roominess, you see three states, uh, C1, C2, C3. And um, they represent the state of the factor interior roominess that we have uh, derived from, uh, from the underlying manifest variables and from the weighted averages of the underlying manifest variables we have derived or rather Bayesian lab has derived these numerical values that are associated with the cluster states. So and given that this is a Bayesian network we can perform inference by setting evidence. So these monitors not only allow us to uh, to yeah, read out and see what the distribution of values are in the monitors, but we can also directly set evidence. So here, for instance, I'm setting evidence interior roominess to the highest state. And consequently, Bayesian Lab updates all the probabilities of all the other variables. So we see now new distributions for overall new vehicle experience, our target node, as well as also new distributions for um, for all the other nodes. So um, that is a, an example of how omnidirectional inference happens in a Bayesian network. Now I'm setting an alternative value. Now I'm setting this to um, I'm setting this to. Oops, went one too far. I'm now setting uh, evidence for interior roominess to a different state to state C1. And once again, all the distributions are updated. If you wonder why this is happening, I'm just highlighting all in this slide, I'm highlighting all the information paths that kind of connect interior roominess to the overall new vehicle experience. So in a way, the information in the Bayesian network crisscrosses and in that crisscrosses all the way to the target node. And in this context, it updates all the nodes that are within the system. So let's now uh, perhaps quickly talk about the, the key measures of importance, which we may consider in the context of or in the context of working towards our optimization. So um, the first one, perhaps that's, that's the one, perhaps the most intuitive one, total effects on target. And once again, I emphasize this is observational inf inference. We're not talking, talking about causality. Rather, we're saying, given that I observe an, a certain increase in any of the factors, what would be the associated increase or decrease in the target node? So if I run this report, uh, this is what I get. This is a list. 
um, that starts off and shows us in order of their standardized total effect. The, it shows us, um, first of all, in the first column, it shows us the, the original, the, the, the prior value, the mean value, or the expected value of the node. Then in the second column, the standardized total effect. And then finally, the total effect, which is perhaps the easiest one to interpret because for interior roominess, this would suggest one unit more in interior roominess satisfaction would increase the overall new vehicle experience, our target node, by 0.623 units. So that's the unit effect. But with unit effect, I always need to be need to emphasize it's really not a causal effect. It's merely an association that we're talking about. Now, the arrow points to the quadrant button. This is an interesting feature that we have because it allows us to look at this unit effect in the context of the variable mean in the kind of quadrant plot. So here we can not only see the, uh, the unit effect on new vehicle experience on the y-axis, but we also can see how, um, how each variable is rated. And so at the further we go to the right, the better. So we can see, for instance, that design and proportions is in the upper right-hand quadrant. It seems important with regard to overall new vehicle experience, but it is also fairly far to the right, meaning people seem to be quite happy. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have price and value all the way to the left, where people are fairly dissatisfied, uh, but it is also important. So uh, this kind of thinking will follow us throughout today's webinar as we're looking at things in terms of, well, what is the influence, the importance, and how well are we doing on this attribute already? Because all, all of these things we need to take into account as we work towards optimization. Here's another recap from the last webinar. Now going beyond total effects, now we're looking at mutual information, which is perhaps a more universal measure because mutual information can also uh, capture the strength of a relationship between nonlinear variables and even categorical variables and numerical variables. So in that sense, whereas total effect is a, a, inevitably a linearized measure, uh, with mutual information, we don't have that constraint. And therefore, you see that the order in which these variables are presented is, is different than what we had seen before. But we can even take this a little bit further and now ask the questions or ask the question, well, are the same variables important for a, for a positive experience as opposed to for a negative experience? One could speculate that perhaps people who are who are happy with their car have different reasons to be happy than those who are very unhappy with their car. This is what we can find out or examine by looking at the, the specific information, the binary mutual information with a specific state of the target node. So now I'm looking at this report, um, just looking at the the topmost state of overall new vehicle experience. And we see here, interior rooming is, is at the top. Um, that's a variable that consistently works its way all the way to the top. Then sound system, then price and value. And again, we can look at this in a quadrant format, which then shows us now, uh, for instance, here on the vertical axis, we have binary mutual information with that top uh, state of new vehicle experience. And um, let me just draw some lines here. Um, and this is for the on the x-axis for the variable mean. 
because uh, I'm, I'm just drawing kind of uh, for design and proportions and for price and value, I'm drawing these reference lines. So I can show you uh, in, the, in a few slides that these lines really haven't changed, that the, the X position of all these variables remains the same, even though the Y position will change as we look at different states of overall new vehicle experience. So this is for the top box. This is here we see the importance of variables for those people or for, for, for like the top choice for the top box response. Whereas now we're looking at the bottom box, like why people may be unhappy or what were the variables that are important for the unhappy respondents. So and here again is the quadrant plot and you see the the just for design and price the x position hasn't changed i mean the average satisfaction is is the same but now we see that there are different at uh, the different levels of importance or rather let me phrase it differently different variables are important with regard to that uh, bottom box response. So safety pops up, for instance. Um, uh, controls, performance handling, display and in instruments, and so on. So that's mutual information. We talked about the background and how mutual information is computed in the webinar in August. Now we're just utilizing it and uh, working with it, and we will be using it as we work our way towards uh, towards optimization. Here's another way how we can explore further this whole topic of what drives satisfaction as opposed to what drives dissatisfaction. So here we can use the tornado diagram and I think this is this is quite a nice visual. It shows us all the variables or all the factor variables stacked on top of each other. Uh, the, the white dashed line shows us kind of the mean satisfaction, the, the, the mean overall new vehicle experience, and then the green bars tell us how observations of, of these factor variables can move the needle up or down. And what's really quite interesting here is that this is not symmetrical. So we see that the certain variables have mostly a downside. For instance, what I've highlighted here, reliability. Because um, if your car is reliability, this is nothing to really get excited about. I mean, it's just, you know, you expect that from any vehicle, regardless of price. Whereas if it's not reliable, that certainly can drag down your, your satisfaction. So I think this, again, gives us a similar insight into yeah, what drives satisfaction versus dissatisfaction. So um, let's now look at this in a little bit more detail and use a visual analysis function in Bayesian Lab. We looked at the total effects report before. Now we are plotting the curves of total effects. Again, observational inference. Very important not to ever think that we're performing causal inference here. What we see here in this plot now are all the lines, all the curves that are simulated by uh, manip or by varying the variable means for all these variables and then seeing what is the associated overall satisfaction. Now, they look fairly linear here, but if you were to zoom in further, you would see these these curves are not linear, that there, there are some kinks in there. And that's certainly something to consider as we go into optimization. Luckily, by virtue of having these curves or have by virtue of having the dynamics of this model represented as a Bayesian network, uh, we don't really need to worry about whether this is linear or nonlinear. Rather, what it is is represented, is captured in the Bayesian network, and any non-linearity is automatically taken into account. So now if we look at this, uh, we may say, hey, this is great. Why don't we just set everything to the max? Let's, you know, let's make 
everybody, all of our customers happy by uh, increasing performance, fuel economy, all of this. Clearly, that's not possible. We can't do that. I mean, it would be naive to think that we can build the perfect car. So somehow we need to figure out, well, what is it that we want to pursue, what we want to invest in? Now, Bayesian Lab has two specific types, and, and there I'm just selecting two of more optimization functions. And I'm first showing the one that we're not going to use. Um, there is a genetic optimization that allows us to really figure out the optimal level of each particular attribute in a domain. So to what level should I set any specific variable? And for instance, for marketing mix optimization, that's perfect because we want to know precisely how much should we spend on this channel, on that channel, on different media, and so on. But of course, this is totally not applicable to consumers because we cannot really, as we said earlier, we cannot manipulate their brains directly. So this is totally impossible to really think we can set our consumers to um, specific target values on all these factors. So the metaphor I like to use is I think of the consumer's mind like a big ship, an oil tanker perhaps, that is very difficult to steer and moves very, very slowly if you want to change direction. So in that context, I think uh, this target dynamic profile function of Bayesian Lab is the appropriate choice because it doesn't tell us you know, do all these 100 things at the same time, but rather it will select what is the top thing to do, what is the first thing you should do to move the needle. And that's what we want to do. This is kind of just a conceptual overview here. Basically, we start with where we are, where the consumer's mind is on average, and then we look at what we could do to improve satisfaction step by step looking or first choosing low hanging fruit if you will the doing the first thing that gives us the biggest lift and then once that's done what's the second thing to do and what's the third thing to do and so on and as you would expect after a number of ma major actions you'll see that kind of the the return diminishes and kind of um, tapers off. And, and yeah, the improvements become smaller and smaller. And you can see that really the biggest bang for the buck you already get, get with the first, uh, first three priorities. So how do we do this? Um, the, um, you can find the target dynamic profile under target optimization. And when you select this option, you get a whole bunch of choices that I want to go through with you step by step. The first thing here in this context is that we want to optimize the mean. So we want to optimize the overall satisfaction or the mean overall satisfaction. In some cases, for instance, if we had net promoter score, Perhaps the objective would be to maximize the difference between um, uh, to maximize the difference between uh, like detractors and promoters. That may be maybe a possibility. Then, what's very obvious, we want to maximize that the overall satisfaction. The next step is something we need to talk about. I'll take a little sidebar here. We need to take into account the joint probability. Why is that? Let me try to illustrate that. Because what we will do is we will simulate different levels, for instance, for reliability and all the other factors, uh, we basically go up and down their scales and, and see what that does to the overall new vehicle experience. But as we kind of stretch to the to the right, as we increase values, then, and here, for instance, let's say we move it all the way to the max to a level of 9.5, we, 
we would have to realize that currently only a very small amount of people are actually rating reliability very highly. So the, the probability that somebody is already at that level is low. And therefore, this would mean that we have to move a lot of folks to this, to this highest possible level, which inevitably is quite unrealistic that we move all these crowds from their wide distribution of perceptions now all the way to the to the top level. So what these uh, bubble diameters indicate is the join probability that is associated with with the levels of simulated reliability. So the status quo is 100%. That's the current rating, the current average rating. And if we move that to the right, you'll see that the joint probability becomes much, much smaller. And therefore, this is a good proxy for the stretch. How far away are we from the current reality? So uh, representing the same thing differently, we can also the blue line here now shows these the simulated um, overall experience as a function of reliability as we go up the scale as we simulate increases with the model and the orange curve shows us how the joint probability decreases how much further away we're moving from current reality now, one very clever thing we can do with Bayesian Lab is we can look at this together, uh, which is now shown in the orange line at the bottom. We increase, we're now multiplying the gain, the increase over the base level. We're multiplying that with the joint probability. And there you can clearly see that that curve levels off. So we can increase, we can simulate further increases, but really they don't give us any further increase. So that's something Bayesian Lab can automatically handle as we simulate values all across, uh, across all factors. So back to our, our options window. The next item is utilize evidence cost. This is something we could use if we had knowledge about, let's say, uh, the, the, the cost of increasing a certain measure by a certain amount. Now, perhaps you may have experience in this domain or, you know, you've worked in this industry before and you know that um, increasing a certain measure or rating costs X million dollars. So, so you could enter your expertise here and assign costs to specific measures. We are going to skip that here, um, but very, very straightforward. Um, next item is we're checking the box for associate evidence scenario file because we want Bayesian Lab as it searches for better or optimal solutions, record the best solutions and record them in an evidence scenario file so we can later on recall that and we can look at all the solutions not just the, the best solution so let's move on to the right side of this this window here we want to select the mean value we want to simulate the mean value of all these factors and there we have a number of choices as to how we want to simulate that. And that may seem confusing at first, but let me illustrate that. Um, again, let's, let's use reliability as an example. This is the marginal distribution of that factor reliability. It has a mean value of just around eight. So if we now wanted to simulate something different, a different value, let's say 8.5, Bayesian Lab gives us a number of ways to do that. For instance, we could just mix this value between two states. Here in this case, if we mix the proportions of state C2 and C3, 
um, 38 versus 61 percent we can specifically obtain the value of 8.5 so that would be the binary approach and this is plausible if you had a variable that you can specifically manipulate like a budget that you can set or you know you control a machine and you can set a certain threshold or or something like this now alternatively we can also use value shift which basically shifts the entire proportion in um, in a similar way basically each each state by the same amount what we're going to use however is using the minimum cross entropy what that does it is it searches Bayesian lab searches for a new mean value of 8.5 that is as close as possible to the original distribution and for our purposes that's really plausible because we're really trying to um, figure out how we can we want to stay close to reality and as we simulate new alternative scenarios we want to really be close or we want to be realistic in our simulation as opposed to you know uh, doing what we would do with the binary simulation where we would imply that there are no more there are no more people who rate reliability at the bottom level so i think that would be a, a pretty extreme stretch so let's now proceed go further into options and the next item that's that's there is edit constraints if we click on that button a window pops up that's our constraint editor and that allows us to set specific constraints for each variable by default the range is very very broad plus minus 100 percent and we can see what that translates into as, as values, the, the minimum mean and the maximum mean, those are the ranges within which Bayesian Lab would experiment to simulate values so as to, max, to, to optimize our target node. Now, plus minus 100% is perhaps unrealistic, so we could apply our own domain knowledge and just enter that there and say, well, perhaps for fuel economy, we expect a gain in perception or in, in rating by a maximum of 5%. We could enter that there. Or, and that's something we, we typically recommend, is that we look at the competitive environment and, and see how our competitors are doing what are the ranges who is or what's the best in class rating for instance now into this area we go into some detail in this the, the seminar that i mentioned earlier the seminar in which we also explain the whole factor analysis process because um and i'm just quickly referencing it so that you know for instance we can look at the ratings of safety across all these brands, all these products, and then perhaps say, well, our limit, our outer limit for improvement is perhaps the vehicle that has the best in class rating. So again, we stay realistic in what we want to pursue in our optimization. So we're not saying, hey, uh, that you try to optimize a Prius and uh, you know and and think you can achieve the performance satisfaction of somebody who buys a Porsche so, so so we want to take relevant vehicles in the segment look at their ratings and then perhaps use those vehicles as benchmarks so um, so these are now our constraints and once we have defined these constraints we can run the optimization uh, it's, it's fairly quick depending on how many interim steps you define for 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 simulating the value actually i don't think i have a slide for that but there is a box that allows you to specify how many steps you want to simulate 
across the range of values for each variable. Anyway, let's run this now. And this is the report that now gives us in order of priority what we should do for this uh, particular product. And here you see display and, and instruments at uh, the top. And uh, here I also see a typo, design and details, control, sound system, refinement. This is the order of priority in which we should pursue product improvements for this particular vehicle. So let's look at this in, to, in a little bit more detail. Okay, so for instance, for display and instruments, we the original rating, average rating was 7.885. What Bayesia Lab says is if you manage to increase that to move that to 8.3, that then your overall satisfaction, your overall new vehicle experience will increase to 7.78. So that would be the lift that we expect given that we implement this improvement. Now, of course, given that everything is related, by virtue of improving this, we inevitably have an impact on the rest of the variables. So because in a consumer's mind, you can't really affect things in isolation and pr presumably if you're happy with one aspect of the vehicle then you might also be very happy about some other attribute that's what we have captured from from the survey data and that's what we've represented in the network so then this network model now says if we reach this new level as a side effect, if you will, we would also have improved the satisfaction of design and details to 7.939. Now, if we take that further, if we were to increase that to a new level of 8.229, that will now increase our new overall satisfaction to 7.87. In the rightmost column, you can see the joint probability, which is decreasing, which indicates how we're kind of stretching from current reality. And, and that joint probability number decreases. And now we could go, we could keep going through this list and, and see how further actions further improve the overall new vehicle experience. And you can also see that the improvements become smaller and smaller and smaller, indicating we really get the biggest impact from the top two or three activities or product improvement initiatives. Now, what is really interesting is if you compare this now with the overall, uh, with, the, with the total effects report, because that's, that's perhaps the first thing that most analysts go to when they try to figure out what is important with regard to an, a target variable. And if we now look at the report in the right panel and then look at the optimization result in the left panel, we see that the order of priority has really changed. And what seemed to be the most important thing in the report, interior roominess, doesn't even make it into the top eight or nine in the optimization report. So we really get a totally different sense of what we should do, given that we simulate the, all these variations, that we simulate these hypothetical values taking into consideration any constraints and any interactions. So that's why it is often quite misleading if you simply take, you know, the, um, the total effects, rank order them and say, okay, this tells us what we need to do. Um, it's a good rough guideline. It certainly is not a, a how should I say, the, yes, the measures, the values are correct, but they may not necessarily be the ideal, may not give you the ideal order of priority for what you should do with regard to a product. So 
Now Bayesian Lab has produced the optimal rank order and um, saved that top um, kind of the, that top, the best scenario, along with the second best, third best, fourth best, and so and so on, in the uh, in the evidence scenario file, which we can subsequently retrieve and review. So I've highlighted this icon that's in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, and by clicking on it, we can look at all the recorded evidence sets. Basically, these are all the scenarios. And I click clicked here on the, the best one. And that brings up that particular scenario. It shows us those particular values, the optimized values. And we can now do a plausibility check and see, OK, is, is does this make sense? Can we, you know, is this in sync with our intuition? with our domain experience. And so all the values that we now see here in the monitors are the same values that the optimization report produced earlier. So from a, from a practical perspective, I think this is an extremely useful approach for very quickly getting um, to really prioritizing target um, or prioritizing actions for, for product improvement. Now we have skipped certain or several elements such as the, the, the factor analysis part, we, we skipped the, the model validation part and so on, and just focused on taking the model once we have it, once we've validated it, and then use that for optimization purposes. So, the actual entire workflow is longer, but still we're now talking about um, perhaps a couple of hours as opposed to many, many hours, days, or weeks that this very same process would perhaps take by traditional means. So the best way to, um, to convince yourself of that is probably to try it out. In a moment, I will share you the link to um, the way you can apply for an evaluation version. And that takes me straight to the, my concluding remarks. Um, and one thing that I always like to mention is our book. There's actually a very similar example in, in the book. Chapter 8 deals with perfume and purchase intent optimization. The, the workflow is very, very similar. So if you want to read up on that, um, you can do that. There, the, the, the book is available for free download, but you can also get it on Amazon. And as I just said, there is an evaluation version available for Bayesian Lab. You can apply for it, the, um, for the, if you will, for the unrestricted evaluation version, you need to apply. The other one, the demo version, you can download straight away. Either way, you can experiment with what I just explained and use the, um, the, the, the webinar or kind of follow along with the recording of this webinar. Now, to see many more use cases of Bayesian Networks and Bayesian Lab, you may want to look at the archive page of our recent conference. There you see researchers from all different backgrounds explain their applications, their use cases with Bayesian Lab. And I think we have like a 15 videos or so of all their talks. To really get deeper into Bayesian Lab, we strongly recommend one of our three-day courses. The next one is coming up December 10th through 12th in New York City. We will be in the fabulous Chrysler building. So. Um, great time of the year to visit New York and we'll be right in Midtown. Another great destination for a Bayesian Lab course is Sydney, Australia in February. Bear in mind it will be summer there while it is very cold where we are here in the Northern Hemisphere. So that will be February 10th through 12th and the week before we have a course in Singapore. Um, obviously also a great destination. So those will be the first few courses at the beginning of next year. Now I'm fast forwarding almost a year from now, 
we will have our eighth annual Bayesian Lab conference. We just finalized the venue and the dates. So more specifically, our eighth annual Bayesian Lab conference will be in downtown Toronto, right at the heart of the financial district at the Exchange Tower. The main conference days will be October 8th and 9th. So uh, please save the date, mark your calendars, and the registration is already open. So we expect that this, this conference will will probably sell out so it won't won't hurt if you start registering now so with that um, I really appreciate your interest today um, and I would very much also like to continue the conversation with you I've kind of uh, I've skipped over some of some of the details some of the things you can look up in the book for others you may simply want to drop me an email and ask a question about how I did certain things very very happy to answer questions one-on-one -on -one. also feel free to connect with us on Facebook LinkedIn Twitter um, it's also a good way to to stay up to date with all the activities that we are scheduling regularly. So with that, thank you again and have a great day.